Hello, hello. Good morning to Europe and good afternoon to Asia. Welcome to our session at the uh, Sengalan Symposium. I'm Li Xing from Taishin Media. And our session is Revive the Ties that Binds Between East and West, Binds Between Europe and Asia. And today we have on the stage with us two very distinguished speakers. And also we have in the room about 50 distinguished participants. And it's quite a wonder in the uh, after uh, the post-COVID world. Um, let me quickly introduce our speakers today. Um, Minister Giorgio needs actually very little introduction. He used to be run many different cabinet posts in the Singapore government, ranging from health to information, and, and, and then several years as the foreign minister. And also, he's one of the most respected thinkers from not just Singapore, but also in the Asia region. And then um, Edward Chia, the parliament the member of the parliament, the deputy chairman of the government uh, parliamentary committee on manpower. And also he has a business background as well. He's the co-founder and managing director of Timber Group. And I heard that was funded before you started your undergrad study. Yes, that's right. So a young entrepreneur and politician with those different voices and we'll discuss how to revive the ties, how to build trust uh, between Europe and Asia. I want the both of you to start with a quick comments defining the question, and then we'll have a discussion on the stage, and, but we'll leave 10 minutes for participants to uh, ask questions to uh, our speakers today. So let's start with the minister. Thank you, Lisin. Mm -hmm. uh, this morning, I read a report from the Holy Cross Pontifical University in Rome about this very subject of the loss of trust in the world that uh, in the survey, uh, the trust of entrepreneurs is 48%, of journalists, 45%, of religious leaders, 42%, of politicians, 41%. So we have a problem in the world that key institutions are now under attack for a variety of reasons. And it makes the point that the session we have today is extremely relevant to our common state of health. I'm glad we are in the journalism, we are in the relatively <laughs> healthy range. Always relative. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so how about... Um, Edward? Sure. Th thank you so much. First of all, thank you to the St. Garland's Foundation for having me. Uh, Ten years ago, I was actually in Switzerland uh, attending uh, St. Garland's Symphony as a, as a youth. Um, I think since Minister has sh shared the relative trust, I, I think I shall speak as an entrepreneur. Um, and I think rather than focusing on challenges, um, I think we would like today to share about, I see the opportunities of further corporations and building trust. And I think before we talk about corporations and trust, uh, we need to revisit common values and the common good. And if we can focus on values, between Asian values and European values that are common and have mutual understanding and respect, I think that's the first good starting point. And to look for opportunities where we could collaborate and through action build trust. And I always believe in values and action. And I think one key area um, that as, as, as businesses are actually looking out for uh, is the area of sustainability. I think Europe has a very established uh, ESG mandate. There is a growing impact investments uh, uh, in Europe. Many pension funds, many investors, family offices are looking at what more can they do with their capital. It's not just achieving financial outcomes, but also uh, social good and environmental good. And I think we are starting to see that a lot more appetite in Asia, many investors, sovereign wealth funds, family offices are also looking towards that. So I think these are areas of opportunities of collaboration anchored on values and true actions actually bit by bit rebuilding trust. And, 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 in, and beyond that, it's also about digital connectivity. I think um, often we say never waste a crisis and we're so pleased today that we could have a physical session with our global audience. And one of the things that I think we have seen through COVID-19 is enhanced digital connectivity. Uh, today, we are able to have a Zoom call. We may not need to travel as much as before. But beyond that, what more can we do with digital connectivity? And I think there has to be common standards. Uh, businesses want stability. Businesses would like predictability. And businesses need consistency of rules. 
And with interoperability rules, there would then be a lot more collaborations. So I think that's a key area. And I think my last point is, as a, now speaking as a member of parliament, um, on note of digital, uh, my biggest concern is also that digital connectivity could also be now a new digital divide among society. Um, and especially for our seniors, and I think in Asia and Europe, we are facing an aging population. How can we ensure that digital connectivity also means digital inclusivity across all demographics? And as populations get um, uh, ages, how can we deal with this new demographic? How can we ensure that society as a whole moves? And that's the only way to build trust. If everybody feels that there is equitable progress, I progress, you progress, and we are all working in the same direction together. And, and trust cannot be just rhetoric, it has to be actions, and it has to be outcomes. Thank you, yep. Edward. Thank we you. heard about the challenges, we heard about the building blocks on how to leverage the opportunities. But I want, we will come back to some of the points you made, but I want to sit back a little and more put that into the broader perspective. Are there different interpretations of the trust in Europe versus Asia, or in Asia, or in East versus the West, Minister? No, whether we trust the person or not, we need to meet and break bread together. It's not just what we receive uh, through our ears and eyes. It's also a multitude of factors, the body language, the, uh, the subconscious elements of communication. These are animal instincts in us which, which inform us whether to, to get closer or to move further away. So trust is something very quintessentially human. And there's a breakdown of trust today because hierarchies are being corroded by technology. When the microphone, when the camera is ubiquitous, then you are fully exposed for what you are. Uh, in the old days, the bad old days or the good old days, depending on your point of view, you protect hierarchy through hypocrisy, through control of information, through myth sometimes through lies. But today, everything's exposed. If a picture looks perfect, your conclusion must be that it is false. Because nothing real is perfect. And when the basis of trust is brittle, based upon all the elements used to buttress a, a hierarchy, I think technology has swept that away. So we're into a new period where hierarchies are dissolving, not to atoms, but to building blocks, which are based upon human networks, religious networks, families, travel networks. And today, if someone tells you this has happened, because you know that person, you believe it. If you read it in the news, you're not so sure. If you read it in the social media, you're not so sure. And what we are seeing now is COVID accelerating the entire process of corroding trust within societies, between societies. We would have thought that a common crisis like this would draw us all together as human beings. But we know that crisis brings out the best and the worst in us. And I think sadly, up to now at least, it's brought out many ugly features of human society, that in a crunch, do we share, do we look out for one another, or do we hoard for ourselves, protect ourselves, and ignore the person next door? Whom do we share with? Whom do we protect? Who are important to us? Who are less important to us? So you just talk about the technologies that's wiping away this traditional sense of hierarchy and especially in the wake of the COVID. And you started by alerting us that people are losing their trust in the institutions. Are institutions winning back the trust? Or how can they do that if they want to? No, I fear that this is a period that we have to go through in human history. We are in transition. You know, every day when we scan the various news reports, to me, what's happening in China and what's happening in India present a very stark contrast. India is going through hell right now. 
in China, they're having the May Day holidays. And you would have seen pictures on CNA and Straits Times, Chinese tourists on the Great Wall, packed to the gills, many not wearing masks. Now, what's happening? Does this mean that China is superior to India? In some ways, yes. But not in all ways, because sometimes a strength is a weakness and a weakness is a strength. How is it China is able to build such an amazing biological wall around itself? To get into China now is very difficult. For a few weeks, you're treated as if you're a prisoner. But finally, when you're released at the other end, you have the freedom of a continent. During that few weeks, well, we have no human rights. And if you are one of those guarding that biological wall, like one of those guarding the Great Wall in the past, if you are asleep on the job, if you slacken in your duties, off of your head, the system is that disciplined. The world today is almost divided into two halves. There's China, where there is freedom of movement across the continent, and the rest of the world. But only China can achieve this because it is China. Throughout history, it has built walls to protect what is really a homogeneous population. And the homogeneity of this population, in a sense, is what frightens the rest of the world now and creating a lot of distrust. They are used to a certain way of operating and patting China on the head. And now more and more China is showing itself bigger, stronger, sometimes threatening, economically, even culturally. And people don't quite know how to handle this. So a big source of distrust in the world today is that between the West and China. It's, it's to me, a, a critical period in history. Uh, Sino-US relations uh, is not improved under Biden. It will get worse. It will get worse because the Biden administration is more subtle, cleverer in the way it handles its China policy across a broad front, soft and hard, winning allies. So I think China will have a hard time in the next one, two years. But will they succeed? I doubt it. Because China is big enough, the whole dual circulation economy is precisely to address such a scenario. I think after a few years, many in the West will come to the conclusion that, no, let's find another way to deal with China, a more constructive way. But in between, during this transition, there could be dangers. Uh, accidents could happen, working on mass emotions, and the world can take a different turning. So this is something which, which we should think about uh, when we talk about growing distrust in the world. So trust can be earned by reality, but it takes time. And it's during the process, you have to handle that with great care. Indeed, it takes time to build trust, but trust also requires understanding and knowledge. It cannot be based on superficial understanding of appearances. When the Jesuits went to China in the 16th century, someone like Matteo Ricci, they didn't have gunboats behind them. They didn't have cannons behind them. They had to persuade and win over Chinese intellectuals. So they did that first by diving deep into Chinese philosophical traditions, the classic, the Se Shu Wu Ting. And Matteo Ricci did a fantastic job. He and his fellow Jesuits did a fantastic job translating the classics into Latin. And this in turn affected the whole intellectual climate in Europe. Eventually, persuaded a whole generation of French encyclopedists that it is possible to have morality without religion and really laying the basis for the French Revolution. In the 19th century, when the missionaries came, they were backed by gunboats and soldiers. So it was a different kind of conversion. 
we have to go back to an earlier period where each tried to understand the other in his own terms. That we frequently misunderstand one another because we start from different axioms. That if I understand your axioms and I understand the Euclidean extrapolations, then I say, ah, this is what you mean. I've misread you. That's the basis of trust. It stands from deep understanding, humility, because you must be skeptical about your assumptions. It requires inquiry. It requires dialogue. And I can just want to add on yes. that, that actually trust is, is also, over time, it needs to be built and it has to be a true engagement. Now, I really agree, Minister, that you have to meet someone in person, have break bread together, have a meal together. And it's also important to have humility and take the interest to actually understand each other's culture. And I think that's, again, uh, education plays a huge part about measuring each other. Is how much can I trust you? And then when the main course came, then we start talking business. So it, it's a bit like dating sometimes. You have to, to get to know that person, understand the values, where they're coming from, and then go into it. Often we, we tend to be so efficient. We go straight into the matter of topic and we start talking business. Um, and, and that's where misunderstandings could happen. And I think sometimes we need to take a step back have to, to meet each other and understand each other culture, cultural differences and then find commonalities. There will always be differences and that's great because that gives the world diversity. Uh, we, we cannot force each other to be the same because diversity is beautiful. And then respecting that diversity and then find that common values and common interests or which to build upon. Yeah. But if we take that one step further, I mean, now we have so much information available, so many means of communication. And before COVID, the travel was much easier to go there and see with your eyes. And why the trust is actually reduced instead of increased? Because it's not just a physical mass. I think we have cultural mass, we have mental mass, which prevents us from understanding the other party. I, I'm an external advisor to the European University Institute School for Transnational Governance. And I was at a session like this just a few weeks ago. And he had introductory remarks by uh, European leader Barroso. And he made a sentence which grabbed me. He said, the essence of Europe is translation. Because Europe is diverse. And to be a European means I accept that we are diverse. You're Portuguese, you're Estonian, you're Italian, you're German, you're Swede. And we need translation. To me, that's very inspiring. I was for seven years on various committees in the Vatican. At any meeting, when you sit down, you put on earphones, you translate. Without the earphones, without understanding the other party, you cannot communicate. So when I read how, say in Europe, on Xinjiang, a quick conclusion that there's genocide in, in Xinjiang, I thought, there's a breakdown here. There is an intellectual mask in place. The Holocaust was genocide. The killing of the Armenians in Turkey, that was genocide. But what's happening in Xinjiang? Yes, the Chinese take very rough measures against extremist Muslims. So do the French in France. But to blithely label it as genocide? To me, that is an abuse and a misuse of the term. And to me, it reflects something much deeper. An unwillingness to go deeper into people's behavior. And if in communication, we start looking at each other and say, oh, you are genocidal, you are cruel, you are this, you are that. And you do the same to me without understanding. How can we build trust? Then trust is just a word, a superficiality that we employ. To have trust, there must first be humility mm -hmm. and a willingness to say, look, I may be wrong, let me inquire further, get at the truth of it. And I think the humility is also on the part of institutions and leaders. 
uh, you ask about how, what can institutions do, I actually think it's firstly, leaders have to take the position of accepting that you don't know everything and it's important to engage citizens, uh, engage across demographics, especially young people, uh, they are the future, um, and really to engage and listen intently and authentically and, and, and say that and, and, have, and not just have not really an open mind to have you must be anchored with certain values but to 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 say that look I might not agree with you but I will listen and I try my very best to understand your point of view and it's not just between countries we're talking within society with between the young and the wise right um, and our, our seniors as well so I think it's important that institutions and leaders, including our business owners, we have to engage. Um, even for as a business owner, uh, during COVID-19, I think for businesses who have weathered through, it's because business leaders have doubled down on engagement. Because during COVID-19, a business leader need to understand how our employees feel. The insecurity of the jobs, they don't know what to do because advisories, health advisories were changing on a weekly basis. And it's incumbent upon then the business leaders to, and owners to say, do not treat the workers as workers, but lives and livelihoods as stakeholders. Engage, be the bearer of truth and consistency, and say, we'll get this through together. And all this has to be engaged, through engagements. And through these engagements, an employer and employee then builds trust as well. Right? So I, I really think engagement, and really agree, Minister, it has to come from, uh, uh, from humility. And, and, and really be authentic. And really, uh, people can sense the sincerity. Mm. Right? Whether you are sincere or insincere, it's animal instinct. I think it's human instinct that the moment we meet a new person, we are sizing them up, and the first question that pops in, I guess in a subconscious mind, is can I trust this person? How sincere is this person? And that has to come true authentically. Yeah. Mm. So humanity and also the attitude as yes. the building block. The disposition, the your disposition. Is, what is the starting disposition? Yeah. And but Edward, you started your comments on something that is very um, salient these days: the digital economy, which is, in other words, people feel that's more of a trust economy because so much is related on trust, and it's also at the very center of the current. U.S.-China relations or how China is dealing with the rest of the world as well. As we move digitalization, as we accelerating the rate of digitalization and we encounter the different standards or we encounter the different level of trust citizens have with the leadership, with the companies, with the data and all this and that. And how do you build the bridge across those barriers when you have different interpretation of the trust? In so I think that's business? where really governments have to play a role. You can't expect a company uh, to come out with a privacy policy or a cybersecurity policy. And even if a company does, it does not encourage interoperability beyond geographic territory. So I think that's where the role of government comes in, G2G or, or regions, to set up certain protocols, interoperability um, standards with regards to privacy. I think today most with regards to digitalization are concerned about privacy. And could there be real clear standards? And businesses want to know those standards because then they don't have to think so much. They don't have to second guess different authorities and different regulators across different countries. They say, OK, this is what probably ASEAN has agreed upon or EU has agreed upon with each other. And now if I subscribe to it, I, I benefit because as a business owner, I could scale within ASEAN and Europe. But today, if different countries have different standards, it's extremely difficult for a business owner to operate because every country uh, its operations, they have to basically come uh, deliver its products and services digitally through different standards. So I think that's where governments have to come together to provide those benchmarks and those standards. And, and it's a great opportunity because if we can do so, it creates a lot more connectivity, not just digitally, but from a people to people's perspective as well. Yeah. Um, and I think the top of concern is privacy. Right? So if we can, we can surmount those challenges, I think that will, be, uh, will, will take us to the next level. I want to ask the uh, minister as well, when you have, societies have different standards or different cultural history of the trust, can they reconcile with the standards? We should 
begin on the basis that we are different, and that we must respect differences. If the condition for relationship is that you must be like me, then the relationship breaks down before it begins. So whether it's between husband and wife, between par parents and children, we accept that we are different, and we begin on that basis. On that basis, we seek commonality and cooperation. So the Procrustean idea that we can only work together if we are standardized, I think this goes against something very fundamental, very deep in human nature, which is why the European organizing principle of subsidiarity, when it is well carried out, is so precious. It cannot be bureaucratized. The idea that each is unique and autonomous, both intellectually and in ownership of property, and that that autonomy should only be reduced by necessity, if there is a higher requirement. And that necessity should not be lightly invoked. The problem today is confusion. The media is both a cause and effect of this confusion because of the proliferation of senses. We don't know whom to believe. And the media, instead of being or originators of truth, becomes transmitters of information and amplifies of information, truth and falsehood. So today, we don't know whom to believe. And every day, as a discipline, I access uh, not just Haisin, but also CGTN, BBC, AOT, Al Jazeera, Deutsche Welle, Fox, accepting that none is objective, that everyone has a perspective. And we say, oh, the media is a growth industry. Do we really need more confusion? I would say <laughs> to what Edward said, seeking opportunity. The opportunity is not in adding to the information overload, but in subtracting, in distilling, in crystallizing, mm. in templates of objective assessment. So that when you read it and say, look, okay, there's a consistency in the way the information is presented. I know where the built-in biases are, and I accept those built-in biases in order to get a certain point of view. And the world needs much more of it. And today, we don't trust a church or institution or school or university. We look to individuals. And we say, yes, he's usually right. He makes sense. This is Henry Kissinger. This is Pope Francis. This is Donald Trump. We, we know where it's coming from. So I accept that there is a tendency in that communication. But this is an age of confusion. The confusion is both a cause and effect of the fragmentation which technology has brought about in this world today. And it presents to us a huge challenge. And I think that trust cannot be re-established architecturally. I think that trust has got to be re-established organically, link by link, layer by layer, between human beings, between human groups, across groups. It takes time, and it is dynamic, it is neural, uh, it is not unchanging, it is vital, and it is part of life. And that's why discussions like this we have at a Sengala and Symposium is critically important to understand each other and then to build this vital link. Um, I want to touch upon, uh, uh, echo our, the title, the topic of our session, the Reviving the Ties, Binding Europe and Asia. Asking a very uh, topical question, how to define the ties between Europe and Asia in light of the US-China relations? Will that be hijacked by the US-China relations? My wish is that the intellectual tradition of the Jesuits in an earlier period in discovering Asia could be revived in Europe. And Europe has institutions. It has a tradition. It has the legacy. It has the talent to rediscover different parts of Asia, not as conquistados, as conquerors, as colonialists, but as missionaries, 
the Chinese study Europe intensely. They have more, they teach more Esperanto than in Europe. And I've been encouraging them to build Latin centers because without Latin, you can't really appreciate the underpinnings of Europe. On every institution in Europe, from the Altingi in Iceland to the Magna Carta to the Helvetian Confederation in Switzerland, they have experts. But are there comparable experts from Europe, in China, in India? I see the way the Mahakumbela is presented in the Western media. The kind of scorn there is of India that, look, oh, you are such and such a society. That's why you're suffering all this pandemic. Is there an attempt to understand India deeply in its philosophical tradition? How is it Nalanda could have been the world's greatest university for centuries, before Bologna, before Oxford, before Cambridge? No. Because Europe has been ascendant for so long, it lost some of those instincts. I say recover those instincts. Because Europe has within a, sh a relatively small continental area a richness which is seen nowhere else in the world. China had this richness over 2,000 years ago during the period of the Zhou, during the period of Chongqiu and the Warring States. And it created a fertility of ideas which continue to guide China in the centuries thereafter. Europe, like the China of that period, is constantly bubbling and in ferment with all these explorations. And this is a source of wisdom for the world. So go back to the traditional wisdom that guide us where we are. And Edward, how would you advise from the ASEAN perspective or maybe from the business perspective to revive the ties between Europe and Asia? I think it's, it's about focusing on the opportunities. And today, climate change um, is an existential crisis. We all face the same challenge. Um, I am actually quite positive because I see many European impact investors looking into the Asian region for collaboration. Um, I see a lot of joint research between our research institutions within Asia and Europe. And the joint research is actually a very encouraging sign. And, how, and I guess the opportunity is how can some of this joint research translate uh, to actual economic outcomes. So more business collaboration with our research institutions and saying that the common goal is an area of sustainability. So like what I said in the beginning, if we can focus on areas of cooperation where we say this is a common problem and we can come together, I think that's, that's where we could start forging closer ties. And um, as a business owner, it would be wonderful if we could start working closer with research institutions. Because why spend money on your R&D where you actually collaborate with research institutions which, which has so much material? materials. And I think research institutions want to also get its um, technology out and uh, to impact society. So that partnership between businesses, research institutions, and then focusing on, on sustainability is probably a common challenge. Um, it's, I think, areas where, where we could look into. And we should... May I ask Edward a question? Please. <laughs> to what yes. extent has your business been inspired by cross-fertilization of East and West? Very much so. Eh? We are in the music business. So I think music is, is something that has cross-fertilized cultures. Uh, the melodies from... Uh, so if you look at a traditional pop song, you have the bit of the blues, a bit of the jazz and pop. We have um, a music venue that predominantly performs bilingual music, English and Chinese. So the musicians are effectively bilingual. They are exposed to Western music, they are exposed to Asian pop. And sometimes that's wonderful because in one session, they're singing both English and Mandarin songs. Your customers? And my customers are effectively bilingual and they actually want to listen to both English and Mandarin songs. Right? So, so that's the root of our, the core of our business. We you are, must invite me. <laughs> we are in the <laughs> business of, of developing Singapore musicians and, and we are in the business of actually of culture, right? of cross-cultural fertilization. So it's, it's the founding mission. It's the core of our business. It's a vivid example. And with that, we want to open the floor um, and take questions from our participants um, today. So please raise your hand. A mic will come to you, I believe. Yes. 
Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Tseng Rong. First, uh, great discussion by the panel. Uh, I'm with a risk consulting company advising some of the ASEAN member states, and I'm an adjunct with um, SMU, NTU, and SUTD. Um, delighted to be here today. Uh, I think that a lot of our discussion has been revolving around like institutional trust, right? Coming to breaking bread with people, which I totally agree. I'd like to just maybe use this opportunity to draw the discussion to like on a more individual level basis. How do I trust a total stranger per se? So I'm bringing up this um, discussion, hoping to come up with this discussion is because um, because of COVID last year. Um, I felt that I wanted to do something, so I actually started this social enterprise that basically connects total strangers, right? Basically people who need help and people who are able to help. That's basically what we do. And so far, the traction that we've gained uh, on average is, is increasing a bit over since we started around mid May, June last year. Um, on average, about a family is receiving help about on a weekly basis. So that's, that's something that we've done. About 50 of families have been helped. Um, so I, I believe that there is something there, right? Take note that these are total strangers. They have no idea who they are. Uh, but somehow, this helper, they do trust these people that need help. They trust that they are in a, they, they are in a situation where they need to receive help. So I just want to, like, maybe... Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. yeah, I just want to maybe use this opportunity to check whether do you think it's reasonable for someone to help a total stranger mm -hmm. or if there's any way that we can use technology to, to like, um, catalyze this form okay. of trust, in a sense. And... Let's take the opportunity because we have a few minutes left. So any other questions, we'll take the chance and ask the uh, speakers to answer together. So this gentleman over here. I can speak, yes. Sorry, shall I go ahead or? Yeah. Please. Okay. Um, Graf Seacott from uh, uh, Sangan Institute of Management here. I came to Singapore 26 years ago to show uh, Asia to my children. Um, having grown up in Germany and worked in East Germany and intercultural questions play a big role, as you say, in Europe, I think there's not only the culture that plays a role. We often hear you can't trust the Chinese, you can't trust the Indians, you can't trust the Americans. My learning was that also the kind of society where you grow up plays a big role, whether it's authoritarian or more open. And uh, having spent a lot of time after German reunification in East Germany, I saw the same thing in our own country. So is that also a dimension I think uh, we have to watch and how do we solve it when we meet people who grew up in a system where telling the truth or trusting someone could actually cost your life? Thank you for the comments. And very last question, but try to keep it short. We have only one minute left. Very short. Uh, there's a difference between trust and being trustworthy and trusted. It's about behavior and action. So I want to know, um, what would you think has worked better? A society where rules are followed, but people just follow the rules, or a society in which people believe in doing the right thing and trust in doing the right thing. In Europe and Asia, we've had vastly different strategies for COVID containment. Some have worked in the short term very well, others not so well. So what do you think is the better approach? Who's ultimately done it better? Who's better deferred their own interests and collaborated for the greater good? I'm Philip Christian, I'm gonna keep it that short. So we have one minute for the two of you to pick your answer and make that short. So maybe maybe I'll, I'll do a quick one, okay? Mm. So I, I, I think there are, and I think during COVID-19, you have seen so much outpouring of, of goodness people who really want to help, and there's so much donations, philanthropy. So I, I am actually generally positive that there is still very much good in humanity. And when a crisis happens, there are people who want to step forward. So thank you for setting up that platform. On your question, um, I think it's, it's not a dichotomy, it's not black or white. I think you need to have rules, but then the role of institutions and leaders are, is to actually engage and explain those rationale of those rules. You can't have rules and then expect people to follow you have to explain why the rules, what are the rationale for those rules, and engage, inspire, and motivate, and convince people to, to, to actually follow those rules. And that was the case for Singapore. We have clear rules, but we take so much effort on the ground to engage as an MP, so much face-to-face -face home visits to engage our residents, text to explain why there are these rules. So I think it's, it's not a dichotomy. It has to go hand in hand. Minister. Minister, please. <laughs> well, to help those we love, whom we know, that's natural. And Confucius makes gradations. 
in the degree of help we should give to people who are related to us. But to help the stranger, that is a difficult message of Jesus Christ, of the Good Samaritan. Do we help the stranger? But if we don't help the stranger, what hope is there for humanity? The world today is being defined by how it's reacting to a common crisis. When COVID began in Europe, the Italians were very angry that the rest of Europe was slow and reluctant in its assistance. Europe took the feedback, was seized by it, and then acted to correct itself. And the result is a greater European solidarity. COVID can either make this a better world or a worse world. And it all turns on whether we're prepared to help the stranger. So what you're doing is fundamentally very important. Sorry, maybe yeah. just a response, because I, I think you asked a question. Uh, my response to that is, actually, it comes down to the role of parents. Uh, I, I do sometimes invite the talks to principals and teachers. And each time I meet our teachers and principals, I say, you have the wrong audience I want to talk to. I want to speak to the parents, because the parents are ultimately the fundamental educator of their children. And we need to restore that, that remind, that responsibility, that parents are important to impart the right values, to their children, and, if, and, and, and family is one of the basic units of society. And in the family, parents have the moral responsibility, and they need to impart the right values to the next generation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Edward. And with that, our time is up, unfortunately, but please join me in thanking our speakers for the wonderful sharing with the wisdom and the concrete steps as well. Thank you. So let's, uh, the signal will get back to Sangala, I believe. All right, so thank you so much, thank Minister. You. Thank you, Edward. Thank you. So thank you very much, dear Mr. Yeo, dear Edward and dear Miss Lee. Thank you very much for this lively and fruitful session. I guess I can speak for all of us here that we really appreciated having a Singapore live session here and globally streamed to our whole conference platform for the 50th St. Gallen Symposium. So thank you very much. It was very meaningful for us and enriching for all of us. So therefore, we would like to give you a small gift from Switzerland as well, with some sweet chocolate, pralines, as well as a souvenir as a thank you. So the souvenir is this cowbell, freshly imported from Switzerland. So therefore, the engraving is unfortunately not done yet, but you can give it to us so we can do it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank, you, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. So I'm very proud that we had the chance of having you all together here on stage to discuss this very relevant topic, trust between Asia and Europe. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.